Good evening, good evening, good evening. Welcome um, to what's going to be a really, really fun evening. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, in they come, in they come. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, this evening we have Carlo Mondavi um, and, and, and his wonderful Rain Wines. Um, Carlo is joining us from California, as you might expect. Um, and uh, it's a delight to see his face always. Um, we, as you will have read in the emails and as you can see in front of you, the first five wines were doing blind. The idea behind this was partly Carlo, Carlo's idea. Carlo, um, whenever I look on Instagram, he's drinking wonderful wines from all around the world, but, but often sat next to his rain wines is a, is a great bottle of Burgundy. Um, and the Mondavis have been doing this for, for forever and a day. They've been sit their wines have sat next to the great wines of uh, Bordeaux or Burgundy. Um, and sorry, in keep on coming in. Welcome, welcome. Um, and we thought it might be a fun way of, of showing the new vintage, the, the 2019, a very important vintage. Um, the way this will pan out, uh, and I hope you've all got two glasses in front of you, but we'll we'll serve the first taste the first two wines side by side, and then we'll, 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 we'll try wine, blind wine three and four side by side, and then five um, at the end. And all I'm gonna ask you for the first two wines is, is there a Burgundy sat in those two wines? And you just, well, just answer on the chat. Sam's in charge of the chat. Sam will sort of get, gather together people's thoughts. Uh, there's no prizes here, but look, um, a, a, bit of, a bit of fun. Um, and um, Carlo doesn't have the the two mystery burgundies, but he's got all all, all the important wines in front of him. Um, Carlo, it's so lovely to see you um, and to share a glass with you, uh, but also to raise a glass. Um, it's been a it's, it's it's been a tumultuous year, but 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 but, but a, a few things to celebrate at the moment. Um, your engagement, which I saw was announced on 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 the Instagram. Um, to the to the um, your, your beautiful Giovanna, um, congratulations on that. Um, Don Dante's birthday yesterday. Three cheers with that. Um, and look, and more sort of significant for this evening. Um, it's a hundred years, hundred years of the Mondavi family making wine in California. Never missed a vintage. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and that's the sort of celebration of the 2019. Um, vintage and you, you you'll all have these cards um and it you you reference your great grandparents but we, of course we all know your grandfather but i you, you, perhaps we could start off by discuss talking about your great grandparents and their journey um from 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 italy um over to yeah. california but lovely to see you i'm going to hand over to to to, to carlo now and um there you are, Carlo. Very good uh, to see you. you. Tom, it's so good to see you. And, and Sam and Sarah and Alice and the Stannery, our, our extended family, it's so good to see you all. Um, and I apologize for this very confusing background, but I am, uh, I'm so happy to be here with you all and I cannot wait until um, life resumes back to normal and we can be back in London. And, and like you were saying, Tom, uh, I'm a big fan of the wine lists in, in England and in London because of just the, the diversity and uh, being able to drink great Burgundy with drink great wines from around the world with uh, certainly, um, you know, wines of California. And I, I know you, you spoke of my, my, um, my great grandparents, which they had such a journey from the old world to the new world. Um, and it came about really because my family was the poorest of the poor from a poor town. And actually maybe Sissy, um, we can pull up a slide just to kind of, go through it really, really briefly, it's just to see kind of where my family has been in the journey that we took. But my great grandparents came from the poorest, a very poor town, and there wasn't much to do. And they were offered a job um, to basically um, your travels covered. And you when you get to uh, Virginia, Minnesota, which is very cool and very far up in the north by by um, Canada, uh, you would have a job. And so they took this 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 trip and made the journey. And um, uh, once they got there, they were in the mines and um, tragedy hit. My great grandfather's brother was killed in a mining collapse. It, he said, this isn't why we came to America. And so uh, he got out of the mines, began a, a boarding house in a saloon. 
And then another American tragedy hit, which was prohibition, which was interestingly serendipitous for my family because prohibition was enacted, put my family out of business. But then um, the town I think felt so poorly from so bad for my, my great grandfather and my great grandmother um, and also had gotten to know him and, and knew of his integrity and, um, and, and, and really cared for him and, and knew that his word was his bond. And they said, Cesare, take our money and go to California and find grapes and, and send us these grapes because during prohibition, um, the government was not willing to go against the church so they for the sacrament and they weren't willing to go against medicine. Um, so wine was still being used for medicinal purposes and for um, uh, re religious purposes. And so families were allowed to have up to four barrels of wine per household. Um, we got into grape shipping. And during this time from 1919 to 33, we were able to see all the different areas of California from Amador County to uh, the South to Lodi to uh, Napa and Sonoma and really get to understand the fruit and, and um, you know, the qualities of the different areas. And then in 33 upon repeal, um, which we were grateful for also was something that put my family out of business. Um, uh, we began uh, with another family, a little winery called Sunny St. Helena in St. Helena, uh, California, where we were, um, we were bottling wine. From there um, in 43, we bought Charles Krug. And actually, Sissy, if we wanna to go to the next slide, I think this is kind of a, um, well, this, this is uh, spanning um, my, my father on the far right, um, my, my father, Tim, who's been, I always say, my family's, um, he's a professor of wine and a professor of art. And he's been my greatest fundamental teacher in wine. And then my grandfather, Robert, on the overall philosophy of, of farming and winemaking and, and really life. And then my grandmother, who was, was big influences for, for both of them and, and through them uh, to my brother and I, who, uh, was really um, talked about food and she was in love with the, the way a meal could elevate a wine and the way a wine could elevate a meal. And so she was gravitated towards um, wines of elegance um, and wines that would, would um, have that kind of beautiful interplay with, with food. And so uh, she passed that along to my, my grandfather and my father and really, I think, it helped evolve how they, they viewed wine and how they made wine. And then just to show a little bit of the history, um, this is great. I love this photograph, especially since we're drinking Burgundy from actually from Burgundy today or this evening instead of, um, uh, you know, a California Burgundy. <laughs> um, I think this is wonderful to show. And I always think of my great grandfather, Cesare, my grandfather, Robert, and my, um, and my great, great uncle, Peter, making this 1944 Charles Krug. We bought Charles Krug in 1943 um, and we began making wine. And this is a reflection of time. Um, back then, if you were making Chardonnay, it was Chablis in California. If you were making sparkling wine, it was Champagne. If it was Cabernet, it would have been maybe Claret or, or Bordeaux. And Pinot Noir was Burgundy. And so uh, I love this bottle because it shows a bit of our, our history and our journey from e Europe back into the United States through our wine journey. And then in 1962, um, my grandfather went on a trip to Bordeaux and Burgundy and he visited with the Grand Cru's and with the first growths. And he said, um, he asked them questions. What are you doing in the vineyards? What are you doing in the cellar? And they said, Robert, we'll tell you everything. Just please do not tell our neighbors. Um, uh, we we, we want to keep these uh, as trade secrets. And they said, who's this guy from California? And so my grandfather came back from this trip in 62 with this fire in his belly. And he said, we have the soil we have the climate, we have the know-how to make, to make wines that can sit in the company of the great wines of the world. We just have to invest in the vineyards, invest in the cellar, and we have to make leaps forward. And we were barely getting by the wine industry and the food, the food, um, uh, you know, restaurant world that as we know it, the great chefs programs that are out there now just were not there yet. And so it was a very challenging time. And my, my great grandfather had since passed and he was the glue that kept my, my grandfather and his brother uh, together. And so my grandfather wanted to make these investments. We didn't have a lot of money in the bank. And uh, my great grandfather wanted to stay the course, or excuse me, my, my, uh, my great uncle wanted to stay the course. And so in 1965, um, kind of uh, things came to blow and my grandfather was asked to leave Charles Krug. Um, I always look at these setbacks and I try to look at the darkest times, like even in COVID, what we're going through right now as, as positively as possible. And I, 
this I know was a very hard time for my, my grandfather, but without that, he would not have began Robert Mondavi. So in 1966, um, he, he began Robert Mondavi with that very goal to say, hey, we have the soil, we have the climate, we have the know-how to make wines that can sit with the company of the great wines of the world. And so he began Robert Mondavi with that, that goal. Um, and these are some of the, he, when he began, he said, we are not Burgundy. We are not um, Champagne. We are not Bordeaux. We are California. We should be very proud of this incredible terroir. And so unilaterally, he put the place and the variety and uh, on his labels and, and began a movement of place um, for us uh, in, in California at the time. And then uh, Tom, similarly, and um, I, I don't know if you want me to talk more about the uh, uh, the, our farming practices and the overall vision of, of what we're doing with rain right now, Tom, is this a good time? Uh, for sure. Carlo, it's extraordinary when you tell that story that you, the family never missed a vintage. Yeah, it's been, it's been falling down and getting back up. And, um, you know, um, along that journey um, in the 80s and 90s, our vineyards were decimated with phylloxera. We didn't understand how to you know, coexist with, with, with phylloxera. Now we understand, but phylloxera is this little, um, for lack of a better ex explanation, it's like a, a microorganism or an insect that uh, attacks the vine's roots and, and, and prohibits it from bringing up nutrients to the vine. And so it, it is the slow death of the vine. And we had to replant um, our vineyards, about 80% of them. Um, and so this is something that has swept through the, the world of wines. If you have clay, um, and your soils, uh, typically these, these louses um, can, can thrive in those soils. They, you see very, very old vines going back pre-prohibition pre in sandy soils um, because they, they just don't, they don't have the silica there to, to exist. But we needed to replant. We made, um, you know, I think another serendipitous mistake, which is um, to decide to, to raise the money for that by going public um, in 2004. We, we sold, um, or we had, for lack of a better explanation, an unwanted sale um, in 2004, which was again serendipitous because my grandfather Robert was there to begin continuum with my father Tim. And my father had been able to see the world of wines. He had been able to visit um, so much uh, in Bordeaux with the partnership with the Rothschild with, with Opus One uh, and to lead the wines there. Um, he was able to lead the wines with, with everything he was doing. And he had a deep passion for Pinot Noir. And he'd become friends with the likes of Henri Jaillet, the generation before him, and, and Gerard Boutel. So I say that those are the two polling opposites. One was the really incredible visionary of de-stemmed wines, and, and Gerard Boutel was the really incredible visionary of whole cluster wines, who they had both, both gone on to influence, you know, whether it's Gerard Boutel you know, influencing Aubert de Valin at Romani Conti or, or Jacques Cesse at Domaine du Jacques or, you know, Jaé, you know, going on to Mayo Camazé and some of the other domains that they've influenced. But they were influences of my father's. And my father inherited this deep love of Pinot Noir. And he embedded that love of Pinot Noir in Dante and I. And so when we sold, they took everything from the sale and they began making one wine from one site right there, continuum in Napa. And um, we stopped making uh, Pinot Noir, we stopped making Chardonnay or Fumé Blanc or anything but that one wine. And um, I'd gone to college in France. I, I worked in Burgundy. My brother Dante um, it, it was in Switzerland. And we just had this incredible love of Pinot Noir that we inherited from our, our grandfather and from our father. And so in 2013, we went off on our own and we began rain on what we'll say, for lack of a better explanation, is, is a true Sonoma coast. So this edge of where you can achieve set and ripen fruit. fruit. Um, it's so cool. We have, in front of the Sonoma Coast, we have one of the deepest channels of water in the world. And it's one of the coolest channels of water in the world. And um, we're way out on this, this extreme edge with three vineyard holdings, um, which is we'll, we'll enjoy this evening. Blind blind to start, um, but it's Seafield um, from Fora Seaview, Bodega, Royal St. Robert. And um, I'll just really quickly talk about why we went to this, this, these locations. Um, my grandfather, my father will, would always preach three things. Um, and Dante and I have um, very much um, found in our own journey that these three things are, are the, the most important. And the first is sight. Um, to make great wines that can sit in the company of the great wines of the world, you has, have to have an incredible sight, a, um, a site that can really, you know, hillsides, well-drained, good exposure. And so there's some really wonderful, what I will call California Grand Cruz along the Sonoma coast. And 
So in this journey, we've we found roughly 18.5 acres of vineyard um, broken up into three incredible sites. And the second um, area that I'm very passionate about is how you treat those sites, how you honor those sites, how you farm these sites. And so um, at Rain, we have a, a philosophy. It's it's a three kind of we have three basic general practices that we follow. And the first is, and our always our goal at Rain is to be a permaculture. So we can jump to the next to see, um, and and a permaculture. So and this is. Um, just to show the the wintertime microflora of the vineyard and um, you have on the left sea field on the right Royal St. Robert and the lower right bodega. Um, the wintertime microflora is so important so you can smell you can almost smell the pine and the floor of the forest and the meadow um, in, in, in just this image here. Um, so we're way out very, very cool. We're cooler than Burgundy many vintages, um, depending on the vintage, but it is a very, very cool site. So talking about uh, in, in the springtime uh, microflora. So this is on the right is, is um, we're already well past this. Um, this was early um, kind of late February, early March. Um, we get these beautiful um, sour grass flowers and it's actually a homeopathic remedy um, and, and a wonderful um, flower. Uh, and as that flower kind of uh, sows in, um, the crimson clover on the left, which is a great nitrogen fixer, and then the white clover and all the native grasses come into play. And we're a perma cover crop, so these we don't sow these cover crops. They naturally regenerate each and every year. Um, but the holy grail of farming for us is, is permaculture, and the permaculture is where um, the farm is a perfect circle. It, it literally permanently sustains itself with no chemicals or no outside input. So, um, for example, if you have uh, a bad insect, you have beneficial flowers that bring in beneficial insects that kick out the bad. It stresses biodiversity and polyculture. And our vision was to have a vineyard where the forest doesn't end at the vineyard, the forest continues in through the vineyard. And so um, we can jump to the next, just uh, to show a couple. So like bluebird boxes to get rid of blue-green sharpshooters. Similar to phylloxera, a blue-green sharpshooter is the vector for Pierce disease, which um, also um, uh, very slowly, but eventually completely disables a vine. And so bluebirds happen to love the way blue-green sharpshooters taste. And so we planted these boxes as an effort to see um, if, if we could go about this um, in a very homeopathic, natural kind of permaculture way. And I remember we put 18 boxes out and this was the first one, this is above Bodega, which is the oldest meter by meter planting on the Sonoma coast. And we had stuck this in the ground and gone up and put the, the rest up at Royal St. Robert. And when we came back down, there was a bluebird sitting on this box. And since the introduction of this, we've seen a steep decline of blue-green sharpshooters um, and an overall increase of bluebirds. So again, the idea that biodiversity, when you, when you have a lot of biodiversity, not one thing can really ramp up and take off. And um, these are all steps that I think that through the green revolution of kind of post-World War I and World War II of, of this chemical era of farming, um, we've lost our way and now we're coming back to it. And so um, if we can't find a permaculture remedy, we go to a biodynamic remedy. Um, and there's one big, there's two big segues back to permaculture that we take. And one is in the animals. Um, we don't believe um, that, you know, we, we believe in animals very much so, but we don't want to be blocking the native animals from being on our farm. And so um, if you have goats or sheep or any animals in the vineyard, uh, you have to have a dog that chases out the, the uh, you know, uh, the, the potential predators. And so we said, um, and we partnered with the Sonoma County Wildlife Rescue, and we said we wanted to create a very wild vineyard. And, um, and so we became a release site for the, the wildlife rescue. This is Doris the Bobcat. Um, she was orphaned uh, in Santa Rosa. They don't release animals in areas that are dangerous. They try to release them in areas where they were found after they've rehabilitated them. But every now and then there is an animal that's been hurt in an area that's not safe to release it. And then they come to us. And so this is Doris, our first release. And I'm very happy to say that um, she was released three springs ago. And then we hadn't seen her until this last spring, not this spring, but the spring previous when lockdown, the first lockdown began. And I was driving up to Royal St. Robert and she was sitting underneath this tree basking in the sun. And uh, the next 
a couple of days after that, um, the neighbors saw her hunting in Royal St. Robert catching gophers. And I know this sounds crazy, but gophers, um, just like anything, out, out of control, they can be very detrimental to a farm. And so having Doris um, there to keep the population in check, we have owl boxes, uh, we've introduced uh, uh, a gray, a bobcat, and many animals since, but having biodiversity keeps everything in balance. And so again, um, back to permaculture for, for animals. Um, and then we're a no-till farm. So we, we, we practice many biodynamic practices. If we can't find a biodynamic remedy, we go to a organic beyond kind of, I would call it more regenerative path. So we're no-till um, and just have this philosophy of really trying to keep the farm wild. Um, on the winemaking side, this is an area that I think Dante and I have an extreme amount of confidence and comfort in. And that's partially because of the hard work that our grandfather and our father's generations. So those two generations, dedicated so much time to science and the understanding of, of what was happening in the cellar. So when my grandfather began, began there, was, there was very little understanding of what malolactic fermentation was, what Britannomyces was, what Eniococcus or Pediococcus or the my, overall microbiology of, a, farm, of, of a, uh, a cellar. And then within the wines, those things that could be parted into wines. And so um, he dedicated himself to the, the understanding of this, my father as well. And now because of all the hard work that they've dedicated themselves to, we have a very vast understanding of how to keep the cellar clean, how to um, uh, basically navigate um, fermentations. And so um, I think there's a good time to just segue really quickly into RAIN and our overall philosophy and, and what we're doing. And the name RAIN itself has a double meaning. Um, the first is, is comes from a story my father told my brothers and sisters and I when we were very young. And he said, do you guys realize that wine is the most natural beverage you can have? That the alchemy or the miracle of water becoming wine happens every year in the vineyards. And I remember sitting there thinking, well, it's so, there was a lab um, at Robert Mondavi back in the day and it was so technical seeming to me. And there was just all these incredibly bright people, um, you know, within, within the cellar and within um, the farm. And I just always felt that it was so scientific. And he told us the, st the story of rain becoming wine. And he said, if you think about it, it rains in the fields, filters through the rocks, the vines drink, the sun sweetens it. And then on the outside of the grape, there's this little wax that collects the native yeast that, that is floating through the air. So that microflora from those a couple of slides ago, the resin from the flowers, the grasses, the trees, the dirt, all stick to that wax and create what we call the bloom. And within the bloom, there's over 50,000 individual yeast cells. So just teeming with native yeast. And so if you do nothing at all, and, and we see this every year, a bird will come peck the grape open or a bee bites it open and a juice mixes with the skins, sugar plus yeast yields alcohol right there without human intervention with just nature, nature doing its thing, the rain that had fallen in the field that was sweetened by the sun becomes wine. And so when we began rain, um, we wanted to um, stress our, our desire to connect to that land, to connect to terroir. And so the unique spelling R-A-E-N stands for our dedication to research in agriculture and enology naturally. So we talked a bit about the farming on the winemaking side. The wines are um, all natively fermented. We don't add yeast. We don't allow yeast in the winery. We don't find, we don't filter. Um, there, the goal is to have as much of every single little, micro part of bloom be a part of this wine that we share and 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 not have um, kind of our hand um, uh, intervene in that. And so, um, you know, we're a whole cluster house as well, which is uh, if, if for my father's teachers from Burgundy, um, you know, we, we followed uh, Gerard Potel and, and and Jacques Sess and Aubert de Valen, who, who have been huge inspirations to us in, in wine in the sense that we love whole cluster. Um, and the reason why is not necessarily because of the romance of the ancient way of making wine. Um, it's more because of the aromatics. So when you when you smell the wines, this beautiful rose petal and tea effect. And this photograph, I think, really sums it up kind of beautifully. Um, when you destem a cluster, for example, as a juxtaposition, if you're going to do a destem fermentation and and a whole cluster fermentation, and this was a journey Dante and I went on, um, which which we has been an incredible journey. Um, to understand what is it. So, you know, I guess I'll just really quickly say my, my grandfather took Dante and I on a trip through Bordeaux and Burgundy to show us what he saw back in, in 1962 that gave him that fire in his belly to, 
to basically say, hey, we have the, the, the soil, the climate to know how to make wines that can sit alongside the great wines of the world. We just have to invest in, 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 in these areas. And uh, so he took us on a trip in 2002 to show us what he saw in 62. And we, there was a day that changed my life. And um, it started with Ancla Le Fleuve, who is just an incredible, she was a force of nature. One of the leaders, I, I always say that the agriculture of the world of wine was changed by two women and that's Ancla Le Fleuve and um, La Lubise Loa. And so we spent uh, the morning with her walking the vineyards and then tasting through her delicious wines. And then um, we went on to Domaine de la Romani Conti and uh, Aubert uh, was a dear friend of my grandfather's and I have some fun stories about, about the two of them. But um, when we first went, we, we did the same vineyards into the cellar and we opened the wine and we tasted and smelled. I just remember smelling this wine and being like, oh my goodness, this is just so aromatic. Um, what is this? And of course, incredible terroir, and of course, incredible domain. Um, but then they were also a whole cluster house. So I said, well, what are the stems doing to the wine? And so when Dante and I began rain, we went on this journey because certainly not all sites are suited for a whole cluster, not all vintages are suited. And so we began this journey and what we found, this picture sums up uh, more or less kind of our discovery. And that is as a juxtaposition to show the difference just really quickly, if you destem um, your, your fruit, and sorry if I'm going into a rabbit hole, everybody, this is, <laughs> but if you destem, um, you break open the berries and all the juice within that berry and that comes outside is in contact with all of that yeast that is on the skins of the grape. So you have all that sugar, all, you do a pump over or punch down, you know, you, you have, for lack of a better explanation, a homogenous tank of skin seeds and juice. And fermentations rip, they, they typically rip to dryness, they, they, they race along, um, uh, they typically are hotter and, and they make wines of texture. Um, but for me, I, I've always been gravitated towards this lift that I see in a whole cluster. And so as a juxtaposition, um, and we sort everything um, in, in, in the vineyard first and then a cellar uh, uh, as a second pass. Um, if you fill the tank- I'm gonna, I'm gonna interrupt you um, yeah. and just call Sam in. Um, yes. Sissy, if you can, if you can um, unmute Sam, but um, we can un unmute himself. But um, there've been lots of guesses on the first two wines. Um, and oh, a lot okay. of people, yes. Lots of people <laughs> um, have worked out that one of the first two is Burgundy and one and, and one is Rain, um, and this ties in very much to the conversation about about whole bunches because, um, uh, well, Sam, are you are you there? I am. Hello, hello, hello. Can, um, can you summarize what, um, what's been going on in the chat? Very briefly, I mean, in a, a year of strange Zooming, this is about the, the first uh, blind I've done anyway. And so thank you to everyone for getting stuck in and, and having a good go. Um, a pretty talented bunch. And the first flurry was putting it as Burgundy in number one and Rain in number two. There were some mixed opinions coming in later, but that was probably the consensus. Most importantly, everyone seems to be enjoying themselves enormously, and they've certainly enjoyed both wines. Um, if I'm going to flag one person up for particular praise, Hugh Carsdell, um, that on the topical moment, uh, talking about wine number two, I don't know if he speculated on what it was, but he was enjoying the savory notes to it and quite stems question mark. So that rather answers the question. Um, but Tom, I will go back to you to be game show host and reveal what they are and say a little bit about both wines. But thank you to everyone for chipping in and please keep going with uh, with all the later wines. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, now put wines three and four in the glass, um, in the two glasses. Um, wine number one. Well, Carla, you've often described um, well, one of your wines as having a Chambol-esque feel. So we thought it might be fun to have a Chambol in the lineup. So we've got a Chambol Amoureuse in wine number one. It's a 2018 Amoureuse from Bichot. Um, and they are increasing their whole bunch percentage, but it's, it's, it's still a relatively low level. It's, I think it's 30% in 2018. Um, and you do feel when you move on to the second wine, which is your wine, you do feel some beautiful aromatics and and um, mm. lift that you get from from the whole bunch fermentation. So wine number two is your Royal St. Robert, yeah. um, which is showing unbelievably well. I, I mean, 
thank you talking a little bit about price i mean we're talking a difference of fourfold or fivefold between those two wines in terms of price and the raw St. robert is on tonight's showing in my glass is a, 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 an equal partner and a, on the chat i was keeping out a, a lot mm. of people saying they preferred your wine um wow. but um what, what's the story behind um Rolls and robert yeah and i, I think um it's Lamorous is just such an incredible vineyard. I've walked that vineyard and I'm such a fan of Shambo Muzini as a village. And um, uh, just, it's an incredible place and an honor to be having our wines sat alongside. Um, and, and blinding is always meant to show that uh, these wines are able to sit in the company of the great wines of the world. Uh, not better, it's art. This is liquid art. We're drinking uh, climate, time and place um, and, and uh, art in, in, in time. So. Um, uh, I just wanted to say that, but this, this particular bottling is dedicated to my grandfather um, and particularly on this vintage with 2019 being such an incredible vintage, uh, we feel lucky that, that it happened to land on our, on our 100th vintage uh, in wine. So, you know, you fall down, you get back up and we haven't been in the same domain all the way through. Um, and, and, and each time as my grandfather and my father have, have noted, we've been able to elevate what we're doing. And, uh, with rain um, when beginning this, we, we said we're focusing purely on Pinot Noir. And so um, this bottling is dedicated to uh, my grandfather, um, who wasn't royal nor a saint, but someone we looked up to in the vineyards, in the cellar, um, and just in life. He was an incredible person to be around. And so we wanted a bottling that would that was dedicated to, to him. Um, and so this is um, a cuvee of the three vineyard holdings that we have with a backbone um, above bodega that is uh, making up roughly 10 acres and a little bit of Seafield gets blended in and a little bit of bodega um, to create um, a wine in honor of, of, of our grandfather. Um, and it, it's, uh, you know, we did get, we were very fortunate. 2019 was just this incredible vintage where there was the warmth that we needed and, and the coolness that we needed to retain acidity um, and, and a vintage that um, I think Will age incredibly, uh, incredibly well, um, and and I am happy to hear is showing nicely alongside um, the Burgundy, but um, I, and yes, uh, also just really quickly the the 2019 the vintage was a wonderful vintage, and and in better vintages we we can go up to 100% whole cluster, uh, and vintages that are challenging, um, we typically uh, will destem um, a, a small amount. Um, but we're always about north of 75% um, whole bunches. So in, in, in 19, it's 100% whole cluster uh, in all three wines that we're going to have tonight from rain. Um, so I, I hope that helps. Um, do you want me to continue on a little bit about why whole cluster, just on that one um, juxtaposition? I think, um, uh, Sissy. Yeah, I think so. I, I, look, it's, it's, um, it's a conversation that we are constantly having, having um, about Burgundy, um, mm. particularly with global warming oh yeah um whether that makes it easier to go whole cluster more often uh, in burgundy um but uh, yeah i think it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing to hear your thoughts yeah i mean climate change is i i think it's Climate change is terrifying because of what it is doing to um, all of us on a global basis. Um, I'm fortunate that I, I, I spend quite a bit of time still in Burgundy, just with my friends there that um, I get to try to buy cases from Stannery because <laughs> uh, they, they bring in my favorites. Um, uh, and then also with Piemonte, with my fiance who, who makes wine in, in Barolo. Um, so we, it's, it's interesting. We're so fortunate in the wine world to be able to have this global conversation um, about it because wine is capturing um, place, it's capturing climate, and it's clap capturing um, a year um, in, in the bottle. And so when you drink back, we can, we're literally drinking climate um, through, through uh, wines as they age. And so it's interesting what's happening right now, and it's really spinning out of control, and it's terrifying. Um, you know, we've seen the extreme heat before the extreme frost um, in Burgundy and Champagne and in Bordeaux and in Tuscany and in Piemonte. Um, and, and out here um, in California, we've seen the wildfires um, and uh, extreme winds and extreme weather. Um, so it's, it's, it's scary. And there is, it's causing us to farm differently, prune differently, um, uh, think about our canopy differently and how we manage the fruit zone differently when we pick. Um, all sorts of <laughs> things go into this. But um, so far, I mean, we, I still see um, 
we're still fortunate that we we have a planet we can make wine in, and I think that we may need to make drastic changes and treat this like a, a an emer the human and environmental emergency that it is, if we want to continue to be able to be fortunate enough to make wines in such special places. But um, the whole cluster. I don't know if Sissy, if you can pull up that photograph really quick, just because I think it captures the why. Why why is Dujac so aromatic? Why is Romani Conti so aromatic? Why is Loire so ar What is this rose petal and tea? And this perplexing question of when Dante and I would destem a tank versus do a whole cluster tank in the same vineyard on a great vintage. Why why did we destem first off? Because we regretted it immediately. And why why is the the um, what are the stems doing to the wine? And what we found is that it's not what the stems are doing to the wine per se. It's what the stems do to the grape. So um, in this picture, you can see the before fermentation um, cluster on the left and the after fermentation on the right. Um, and that's a 22.5 degrees of, of sugar. So bricks is how we measure our sugars in California. And so it would yield, depending on the native yeast, dom there's low ethanol producers and high ethanol producers, but you could say that this would probably make a 12.3 to 12.8 percent alcohol wine, uh, depending on, on what native yeast dominates the fermentation. Um, and then on the right, you can see, so we sort in the vineyards, sort in the cellar, and then as you fill a tank with whole clusters, the weight of the cap crushes the berries at the bottom, the juice inside the berry spills outside, comes into contact with the skins, which begins to ferment, and that off gases and protects the cap. So then instead, when you do a pump, pump over a punch down, you don't have a homogenous tank, you have, you know, slowly but surely all these, you know, juices fermenting outside, and then all of a sudden you get these little inner berry intercellular cellular enzymatic fermentations that that create in an order of magnitude greater aromatic esters because as the aromatic esters would volatilize in the headspace they they don't have that opportunity because they're encapsulated so you have all these little micro ferments and fermentations are typically cooler they're slower they're longer and they make wines of incredible elegance and incredible this beautiful i always call it the, it the rose petal and the tea and um, it accentuates the fruit and flower and gives it beautiful texture. In California, we are blessed that we can have, you know, relatively good weather at 12 and a half, 13 percent alcohol. And so we can be blessed with so much fruit and so much flower that sometimes wines can be dominated by fruit and flower. And so I loved whole bunches because it also had this little pH shift and it gave this velvet center palette that really bonded that fruit and, and flower to the tannin acid and minerality and created this more complex, complete wine. And so um, over time from 13, 14 and 15 through the uh, kind of experiments, we really settled on what rain is as a domain in 15. And in 2015, all bottlings are north of 75% whole bunches. Um, and then the best of vintages are 100% whole cluster. And so um, that's kind of the, the background on, on the, the whole cluster. I think that when you, we, there's, there's this kind of, you know, the, as we deal with climate change and as we um, you know, see what's happening, I know Burgundy has had a string of really lovely vintages, although um, not without challenge um, and not without um, you know, hail and um, you know, frost, but they are able to get in. And as Jeremy says, um, said, there was always this buffer in Burgundy of like 2%. And that that you know, as we watch some of these areas get higher in, in ethanol because of, of the warmer temperatures, there was this 2% buffer. And now Burgundy maybe has arrived at a place where there's really no buffer anymore for chapitalizing. That's increasing kind of that 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 um, ethanol level in the wines. And so um, now we're seeing, um, and uh, I think it is a little bit more challenging to decipher between um, old world and new world, unless you of course are blowing it out and making 15% alcohol wines. But going back to my great grandmother, and my, grandfa my grandfather, the idea of wines, um, finding sites that accentuate wines of elegance, and then um, uh, doing our best to, to reflect that site, to make a wine that will harmonize with the meal and elevate the meal, and the meal will elevate the wine versus being a little heavy handed on, on um, in the cellar and kind of creating wines that are a little bit overpowering. And so we at Rain have always made wines of, of, of elegance, at least we've, 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 that's been a goal for us. Um, and, and how we farm and um, when we pick and, and how we treat them in the cellar. Um, and so that's kind of that. I think, Sissy, we can pop off the the, um, uh, the slide now. I think that's kind of, I just wanted to really quickly give you guys a quick overview on um, 
on our uh, our philosophy of, of of wine making, and then uh, we can dive a bit more into the wines. Does that seem fair, Tom? Should before you do that, um, I, f I feel like we, we, we now might be a, mo a good moment for, for again for Sam to to, to give us a flavour of, of of what's going on in the chat. Um, I've been keeping half an eye, and I actually again a, a very learned cr crew we have on here, and, and I think almost all have got it got it right. Sam, are you, are you in? Are you there? I am indeed uh, a little bit more reticent on this flight, but those who have spoken, again, know their Burgundies, know their Pinot, um, they're in the right direction. Uh, Tom, you're very kind on your clues. Um, so I was going to steer people and they could start speculating on, on which Burgundy producer is, and the Rain fans out there might want to start quickly speculating on which the two Rain's wines are. Um, so we are... Uh, wine three is Carlo's, uh, wine four is a Burgundy known to many people on, on this chat, and number five is Carlo. So if anyone wants to be brave and jump in quickly um, on have a stab of which of Carlo's wines um, are on three and five, Ian's straight in, anyone else like to have a quick chat, but thank you, keep going. Amazing. And I've got to say, Carlo, from, from my perspective, I like reading these cards that you've you've, you've sent through. Uh, are terrific, and, and I guess these are, these are your tasting notes on the back of them. Yeah. Um, and um, well, this gives it away a bit. But, but well, actually, there's talk of rose petal on on um, on a number of the wines. But the the, the, the um, that rose petal that you you mentioned earlier, and again is on the season note. But but in, in wine three, it's just singing, um, and. What was special about 19? Um, the first two of your wines that I've tasted from the vintage are, are, have got lovely balance, lovely aromatics. I mean, soaring aromatics. Um, what's, um, is, is it one of, the, one of the best vintages that you've, you've seen at, the, at, at, um, at Rain? Yeah, it was, I mean, it was as classic and perfect as, of a vintage as you could ask for. Um, 20, I kind of look at 2017 and 2018 as good kind of um, extremes in between. And then you have 2019 comes right down the middle and goes perfectly. So in 2018, it was um, so cool and retained so much acidity and was just this forever long um, uh, hang time. Um, and wines of just incredible elegance. 2017 was this vintage where um, you know, we're really fortunate in, in California that we typically have a beautiful, um, you know, May, we, we get um, flowering and set, and then uh, June, July, everything's right, and then coming along towards the end of August um, into September, um, you get these couple little, little heat waves that, um, you know, bring into focus the, the sugars, the tannins, the acid, and, and in 17, we, we had a series of heat waves that were kind of um, a little bit gr more grand than normal. And, um, and made wines of incredible concentration, but but low alcohol, very vibrant, fresh wines, concentrating acidity and and sugars at low bricks. And then 2019, um, I think you can't have 2019 without 2017 and 2018 with the big rain years. In 17 and 18, the rains were immense. Um, I mean, literally flooding in certain areas. So all the soils replenished, um, the rivers um, and, and, and lakes all refilled. And then um, in 2019, we had a very um, even and, and maybe on the plus size and, and rainfall bud break was um, uh, right on time. It wasn't early, it wasn't late um, with climate change and all that we've been seeing earlier and earlier um, bud break um, just due to warmer, winter, warmer winters, um, but it was a cool winter. Um, and then the growing season itself um, was lovely. It was even. Um, and, and uh, a few showers, um, but nothing, nothing crazy. And then um, along came uh, August and, and uh, September, and it just brought everything right into focus, concentrating acidity, flavors, and retaining acidity because it wasn't overly warm. And literally, it was one of the uh, great vintages and, and a vintage that um, I hope we see a lot more of. It, it, I would say the great vintages make us think that we're better winemakers than we actually are in 2019. Um, uh, certainly um, made life easy for us. Um, and 
um, yeah, a special, a special vintage, and um, particularly special. And I feel incredibly grateful that it happened to happen when um, it was my family's 100th year. You know, 1919 to 2019. We have um, a little RGM. So our, on the bottle itself, it's meant to be a roadmap. So RGM stands for Robert Gerald Mondavi Heart and Soul, because you always say you have to pour your heart and soul into whatever you do in life. But on this, the 2019 bottling, this is just something that we did. We put a little forever sign below that. And then we put a, a, a butterfly, a monarch butterfly um, marking our, it's just a unique um, symbol for our 100th year. And right now, it's kind of also hopefully a reminder to people that um, our climate is in a very unstable and scary place. And the monarch population of butterflies have declined by 99% and they're on the brink of extinction. And so I'm hoping that we can create awareness to protect, you know, um, uh, you know, not just the, the butterflies, but all the different pollinators um, and, you know, the insect kingdom and hopefully um, in turn protect all the animals and in turn protect us. Um, so it was kind of the, that's the reason it's a butterfly. <laughs> so. mm. um, James on the chat has, has, has jumped straight in with, with guessing wine five correctly as Dujac. Um, it's interesting if you, if you then, sorry, wine four is Dujac, the, the Burgundy. Yeah. Um, if you then taste the last wine, but both four and five have got a much darker feel to them. Um, and I think I'll, I'll give the game away. Wine five is is is, is the Bodega Vineyard, which it, it is a it, it's a darker feel of wine. Isn't it? Yeah, part of that Down is that. Uh, it's it's the oldest meter by meter planting, so the vine age plus meter by meter. Um, the just competition that the roots have within each other means that they're going to put out smaller clusters and smaller berries, so more skin contact to juice ratio. So. We've seen this year in and year out. Um, you know, it's it's one of if if Royal St. Robert is where the forest meets the meadow and kind of um, uh, red rose petals, black tea, crushed cherry, and wild strawberry, and and for us, you see, field is is um, kind of where the the forest meets the this big rock slide off into the ocean and more lifted, more orange pith and and red rose petals and 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 kind of red fruit, bright like you know crushed raspberry and wild strawberry and um, and maybe instead of black tea it's white tea uh, when you get to bodega it's properly you're in a humidity of the forest floor it's more unctuous it's more brooding um, it's got that kind of crunchy forest floor with the forny brown mushrooms but then it's on the other side much more exotic so more exotic spice box um, more wild strawberry wet rock rose petals and then back to black tea for me personally and I, I think that it's the product of that meter by meter, the age of the vines, the incredible steep, it's, it's 1.8 acres. It's the oldest meter by meter planting on the Sonoma coast. And the, the kicker is that it's so steep that we can't turn a tractor around it. So we hand farm all of this vineyard. It's just human feet walking through it basically to do everything from picking it to, um, to all the different backpack sprays of all the different biodynamic preparations and all the different things that we do um, uh, is all done by hand. Um, which, which is, is really lovely, but also um, very difficult to, to manage and to do. Um, so it's a, it's a special Carlo, site. Um, the wine three, um, uh, your two wines there, uh, uh, three and five have shown beautifully. It, it, it's a slightly difficult showing of Dujac. It's a little bit re reduced in my glass, but um, you, you, put it, you, you know the Says family well, don't you? you you've, you've, Drunk many a many a good bottle of their wines. They need time, of course. Um, I'm fortunate to, yeah. And I'm a I'm a big fan of uh, of Jacques Sess and and Roz and um, of Jeremy and Alec and and Diana and the whole family. And um, you know, I've been inspired by their wines for for a long time. Um, and you know, it's it, it's kind of interesting. I actually, when I did my stage in Burgundy, it was with the Sess family at Dujac, who are the most incredible. Uh, and hospitable family. I, I do think that um, just one thing to note is that this, th these wines are all very young. And so uh, with time, they will just, and I, I found that quite true with Dujac, if you can just wait even five years, the whole entire dynamics of the wine shift monumentally and they just kind of elevate up. It's just incredible. And um, with with um, uh, the Sess family, my family has a, a, a great history because um, Diana um, is my sister's closest friend 
and she they grew up together in California. And Diana Sess has a winery in Napa, and uh, she was interning um, at Robert Mondavi. And Jeremy Sess came and interned at Robert Mondavi, and I was in the cellar. This was like I was 18 years old, like probably steaming barrels, and she would come in with fruit. And, uh, you know, and he would kind of analyze it into the lab because he was in the lab and they fell in love and, um, and, and now they have a wonderful family there in Burgundy and, and make, you know, some of my favorite wines um, and incredible holdings, including Le Cabot's. Um, yeah. That's a or, cracking story. I did not, I did not know that's where they met. That's, that's a great story. Um, I'm enjoying um, Mike, um, Mike Humphrey's comment here, uh, wine five, utter standout on the aromatics uh, followed by the the, the Royal St. Robert. Um, these 19s are showing well tonight. Um, when would you um, when would you drink them? I mean should we should we wait wait five years or if you can I think I, I mean it depends <clears throat> the, the, the aging of, of wines is um, always such a personal you know preference um, question and for for me, it's that evolution of, of if you have a wine when it's in its it, youth, um, it's it's more husk, it's more tightly wound, and I think of it as like a rose a rose flower. And as it ages, it opens up. And I think in in maybe um, five years, it'll be that really primary open, but still quite tight. And then by age ten, it'll be kind of open and and have those those everything just fully expressing itself. And then by age 15, I'm guessing that they will start to see, you'll start to see some of the drying of the fruit and flower and some of the drying of the rose petals and the, and the condition of the fruit. And then um, uh, over 20 years, some of that kind of underlying earthy characteristics come forward. And so, you, you know, whereas the first 20 years, I imagine it's dominated by fruit and flower. And then the second uh, 20 years, it, it becomes more, more tertiary. And then depending if you like to age wines, I personally love old wines. Um, but a lot of people, you know, and also what you're eating, if you're, if you're having something with more angst, you might like barbecue, you might want the younger wines. Whereas if you're having a little bit more sophistication and a little bit more, um, you know, wines maybe less seasoned and more elegant, um, you'd want maybe to have um, some, some more age. But that's, so it's very broad, but the wines will um, age a significant time, amount of time. I, I, um, you know, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure they will. We should move on to the last wine. Um, thank you so much for sending over um, a, a few bottles of this. And um, well, Sissy has uh, mentioned that she might, you might sell us a few cases this year. Um, this is a wine that, as you say, is for friends and family. Um, the, um, the Chardonnay, which now in my glass, get it all in your glasses. Um, and another, another cheers to you, Carla. This is a real treat to try this. Here's to you as well. I'm going to put this side cup. Thank you guys, um, and thanks for hosting us. And the Chard the Chardonnay is a special, it is a special treat. Um, and I'm, I'm not in my home right now. And I'll, I'll give you guys a tour of where I am uh, in a minute if you guys are interested. But um, this bottling in particular um, is special because when Dante and I began Rain, um, it's when we began in the wine business, I never felt personally like that we would ever be able to sit at a table, you know, where my, my father um, sat and tasted wines. It was always, you know, these you know, incredible minds of, of wine, whether they're PhDs in soil science or masters of age or masters of wine or just incredibly talented um, people in the, in, the, in the wine business. I remember this intimidation and then finally did my walkabout and did my journey and, 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 and just, had years of just diving in and studying as much as I possibly could to learn, learn, learn. Just there was an unquenchable thirst and there still is today. But when Dante and I began Rain, um, you know, this has been what has put food on my family's table for, for now over 100 years. There's nothing behind it. This is what we've, we've you know, focused on. We, it's wine and farming and agriculture. And so when we began Rain, <clears throat> there's always been this, this pressure on us. And when we began Rain, I remember saying to Dante, that we also have to have fun too. We have to make this something that um, that we can enjoy. And so we are a Pinot Noir domain. Our focus is Pinot Noir. Um, one day we were with Michael Brown, um, who, who's one of the founders of Costa Brown, and we were visiting a vineyard. He's, he's he was one of the guys who took us under his wing. A great guy, 
and uh, we visit this vineyard from the Martinelli family. It's called Charles Ranch, and it's one of it's these old, gnarly California sprawl um, pre phylloxera planting of Chardonnay. It's it's clone four and, and Winty clone. And I love Chardonnay. I love, as you guys, we talked about Enclave Le Fleuve and uh, Great White Burgundy and, and Great um, Chardonnay from, from pockets within the California coastline. And um, we were talking about how, how awesome the vineyard was. And he was like, well, do you guys want some of the roads of this vineyard? And we're like, really? And we talked about it and we said, you know, we could just make this and have it for our friends and family. We can drink it and that's it. Like, let's do it. And so we began um, bottling Charles Ranch in 2016, um, a tiny, tiny production. And we would quite literally drink <laughs> all the wine among our friends and family. And uh, that's continued now on with uh, this incredible friendship with the uh, Stannery. And so we, we, we're, we're really happy to be able to um, send you guys some and enjoy wines. And uh, we, we also, you know, just to talk really quickly um, about uh, Charles Ranch, um, you know, it, we wanted, we, we always had this deep belief that there was the ability to make wines that had just that linear, linear, good acidity, good minerality, but in a natural way that you didn't have to block malolactic fermentation or you, you know, you just had to basically find the right site, pick at the right time. And, um, and so this wine is, is follows the exact same line of, of rain. Um, it's brought in, it's whole cluster pressed, um, straight into barrel, barrel fermented, um, and uh, full malolactic fermentation, we do not intervene um, at all along the journey. And um, the wine naturally, um, initially we were, you know, I was um, really looking for a lot more of this very linear um, wine and hoping that that's what it would give us. But it, it because it's a Winty clone, because it's these old California sprawling, um, very old vines, it's a little fatter and has a little bit of this richness to it. Um, it still is lean and with age, it just kind of, um, warms and, 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 and opens, um, but it's a special, special site and we feel honored and blessed to be able to, to, to make it and to drink it and to have it and share it. And, um, and so that's kind of the following of, of, of uh, the four us CV under two miles from the ocean on the same road um, as we get to uh, our Seafield vineyard. And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the general gist. We also, by the way, I'm not sure if everyone has corks given that we're and I can't wait to be back when we can taste in person, but um, we have the date along the corks. We have the, the time of when we pick. So we pick everything in the darkness of the night when it's cool um, to allow for both the fruit and flower to be remain, remain within the clusters. And, and fruit and flower is the most lofty part, the most, it, 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 you can quickly lose it um, if you pick under warm conditions or um, fermentations get out of control. And so we bring the fruit in very cool. And then um, by, by bringing it cool, it fixes that fruit and flower into the juice. And so um, that's something that we carry throughout the, the overall lineup of wines. And we don't pick based on moon phases, but we're just observing um, the moon phases um, to understand you know, maybe what that's doing to sap flow, et cetera, so. Yeah. Thank you, Carlo. Um, I would love to see a little tour of, of where you are. Um, yeah. We are, we are past the hour, but I don't think anyone's going to mind if, if you just show us a little, little of where you are. This is your... Um... So I'll, I'll just really quickly, for like two quick seconds, talk about, um, I never thought in a million years I'd be involved in a technology company, and it's never been, my, my heart and soul is in the farming and the winemaking. But along my journey, and when we sold Robert Mondavi, I witnessed a whole level of farming that kind of was... A little bit shocking the uh, incredible use of herbicides the incredible use of of um just um farming practices that were non-conducive to healthy soil microbiomes healthy farm biology and in turn um, healthy people and so i started to think of the monarch challenge trying to get rid of herbicides and just create through awareness um and then quickly realized that there was a, a divide there was a carbon footprint divide and there was a um uh, a cost divide and and i always think of agriculture um, and in particular in places like Burgundy, where it's, it's, you know, I've got these three rows and then this farm has those four rows and they farm them differently. Everyone's farming differently, but you're kind of sharing that dirt. And so I've always thought in great wine growing regions and great wine that you're only as good as your neighbor's farm. And so I've always tried to create a conversation of how can we elevate that? So I, with the Monarch Challenge, it was just to create awareness, just to have the conversation. And I quickly realized that the only way we were gonna change this is if we made it economically viable. And also if we um, 
uh, made the carbon footprint because there's a carbon footprint divide between organic and, and conventional farming. And they, that is that if you're spraying organic contact sprays, um, you know, the half-life on the vine or on the plant or whatever it is, 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 is much shorter than if you use synthetic systemic systemics. And so along the journey, you know, we're, we're uh, Silicon Valley is just over the, val over the bay um, from us here in Sonoma. And I realized that if you can basically drive a Tesla autonomously, put it in ludicrous mode and have it change lanes uh, autonomously, you could drive a tractor two and three miles per hour. And so I began uh, an electric driver optional smart tractor that's going to make organic farming and regenerative farming cost as much, if not less than um, uh, uh, conventional farming. And so the idea is to help address climate change, which we're dealing with one turning on one tractor right now is like turning on 14 cars and all these crazy things. And again, um, you know, this is, I'm the chief farming officer. So I'm just helping marry this awesome technology that these engineers are building to um, uh, the, agri the farm, the vineyard in the in different areas. So we have like a 40,000 square foot la uh, factory here. And I'll just show you the tractor really quick. Cause no one has seen this by the way. So this is kind of fun to, to show and share. And, um, we're actually just now going to a no mask because um, we have herd immunity within the factory. But um, so we have a lot of ex-Tesla guys, a lot of um, uh, brilliant, brilliant engineers here. But this is our battery pack. It's a custom pack. It's a bigger than anything in auto right now. And here's one of the tractors being built. Got the, the guys. So hopefully a solution to this challenge that we have on a planetary level and we can address over 500 million metric tons of greenhouse gases uh, each year. So anyways, <laughs> I just wanted to give you guys a quick tour and, uh, and thank you guys again for um, hosting this. I cannot wait to be on a plane to London and to be back with you guys and uh, Sarah, Tom, um, uh, you know, uh, the, I, it means a lot that you guys are putting the whole crew together and, and Sam and Alice, uh, thank you guys for everything. Looking forward to be back, being back soon. So, Well, look, thank you, Carlo. That was honestly as about as much fun as I've had for, for a year. Uh, I should get out more, but um, uh, what a thrill to, to taste your 19s. Um, congratulations, they're stunning. Um, I think it did work to taste them next to these very um, illustrious um, Burgundies, um, who uh, a, a, a friend has just uh, re uh, responded to me. He said he thought the Burgundies looked a little awkward next to your wines. Well, maybe that is the case um, that um, that your wines show um, better in their youth than than than. than than a, a equivalent vintage for Burgundy. But um, um, look, I think uh, what tonight has shown is that you make some very, very serious wines um, and it is a joy to import them, to sell them. Um, and we look forward to doing this in person very, very soon. Um, Carlo, thank you so much. And look, and, and thank you everyone for, for coming along and, and um, uh, joining in in, in, in in the chat. Um, I think it's been a, a really f fun evening and um, yeah, um, uh, one note I'll, I'll say, um, I'll, I'll, maybe I should put myself on the screen here. Um, we, um, oh, there I am. Um, we don't have a huge amount of your, your, your wines, Carla, you, you don't make very much. Um, um, do, do you have any plans to increase production at all? Um. So we, it's, we're in that area where similar to what we've seen this year with Burgundy, we, you know, every few years we, we have a very shy crop of group, you know, 18.5 acres and with the ups and downs of mother nature, that's um, kind of, um, an, it's also an area Dante and I love. We're a very small team focused and dedicated to making wines um, that can sit alongside the great wines of the world and from what we feel are California Grand Cru's and we, we talk about it all the time. You know, we're, we're kind of in that, like we're half the size of most of our favorite, you know, houses of Burgundy. And we'd like to be kind of in that size where 
Um, we have a little bit more wine to go around, um, but it has to come with a vineyard that we feel is capable of sitting alongside the vineyards that we have now. And um, I think we've, we've been very fortunate to find the sites that we do and just kind of similar to Burgundy. And if you, if, for those of you that have had that conversation with many of the growers or excuse me, the, the producers of Burgundy, uh, it's very hard to find um, uh, great, great sites. And so um, we're, we're, we're patient, um, we're patiently looking um, uh, and we hope to be able to offer another uh, single bottling uh, sometime uh, in the future. But um, for now, um, you know, focusing on, on what we have here. And, um, but yes, we would love to if we could find the right spot um, and the right vineyard. Um, it's hey, look at that guy. There we go. Um, Carlo, thank you so much. Look, if everyone on the call put their hand up for um, wines three and five, we wouldn't have enough to go around. So, well, if you'd like some, yeah, email as soon as you can, get, 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 uh, or, or, um, or call. The, the, uh, the offer will be out tomorrow morning. Um, and um, I form an orderly queue. Lovely wines. Carlo, a treat. Thank you so much. And thank you, thank you all so much for coming. Um, hope to see you all soon. Uh, get down to Cabot in the city if you can. At the, uh, Cabot is opening on the 17th. Is that right, Sam? Um, I, they're probably busy for the 17th, first. Yeah, I won't be there until the 19th, though. So I, I'm, I'm going to have all of two days. So, what, yeah. what, one of the best meals I've had there is, I mean, the food, the wine, uh, the, everything. Phenomenal. I can't wait to be back. And, and Sam, we <laughs> should probably, we should flag Old Brompton. Um, yes, uh, Stannery New Venture, um, corner of Old Brompton Road and Beena Gardens, gone into it with friends from Cabot, uh, glass of wine, corkage, uh, buy a bottle, pay a tenner to drink it there, lots of wines and domains you'll know and love, um, yeah, it should be fun and in the future we'll be hosting winemaker dinners there so Carlo South Kensington in the future we will be uh, putting in front of lots of people in person I cannot wait literally yeah I can't wait to be back um, so thank you guys again for this this has been a lot of fun thank you Carlo thank you Sam thank you all for joining see you very soon